Welcome into K State Online. I am Mason Voth. That is Drew Galloway here on a Monday, bringing you uh, kind of some reaction and thoughts from Chris Kleiman's press conference today. K State, short turnaround for them, short turnaround for us as they get ready for Arizona now on a Friday night. It is a Big 12 matchup, but it is a non conference game for K State. It's going to be fascinating to see how the play unfolds this Friday. But before we dive into all the thoughts from Chris Kleiman, where I thought there's some interesting and kind of out of nowhere news that came about, uh, let's remind everybody, Drew, that K-State is getting ready to head overseas to start their 2025 season. And what better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on the K-State Wildcats in the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland. The Cats will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. And whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle all on your own, there is a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. So good reminder for everybody that Cats2Ireland.com is the best place for you you're trying to just map out and figure out how what, what am I going to do? How, how do I get to the game? What do I need to do? It's all right there. They'll make it real easy on you. So cats2ireland.com. Now let's uh, just dive right into it. And I, I normally ask D.Y. with this, kind of his top takeaway from what Chris Kleiman had to say. Uh, so I'll do the same for you. What was the most interesting thing you thought Chris Kleiman said today? Uh, to be honest with you, I don't even think it was really – what he said, it was how he was. That was probably the most animated and to be to be completely frank with you, just pissed off uh, that I can remember Chris Kleiman at a press conference, even starting 2-0. and I think that he knows that they have a lot to work on, and that they have a lot to kind of improve on and fix. And I think that that's a good thing because it shows how hungry that he is and how hungry K-State is because they want to continue to improve on those things. But I think that you can kind of see from his body language that he isn't real pleased with how K-State has played in the first two weeks. And I think that that's kind of the general consensus. I mean, you you have won both games and you won one game pretty handily. You beat another team that is probably going to at least compete for their conference on the road in what wasn't probably your best game. But I think that there are a lot more growing pains going on that I think that K-State and Chris Klein probably anticipated. And I think that they're, I think that he's also really wanting to attack those and knows that it's a short week. Well, it's interesting that you talk about his, his body language and the way that he speaks there, because even, you know, coming off of losses by, the time that you get to that that weekly press conference, he's in a much more relaxed mood and just like a like like anybody. You know, you have something that goes on that displeases you or gets you really excited, and and you are moved on by a couple of days later. Like you still you by no means wash everything you've seen, but like you can handle being a normal nice human to people. I'm not saying that he wasn't nice today, but. I think people understand what I'm getting at here is that you can go on and, and everything's normal, not let it fully affect you. You can address kind of those issues, but not do it in the same manner. I think it's probably a good thing that he still comes across that way. Uh, it also may be a little concerning though, if he's acting like that, because I mean, to, to you, does that come across then that it's not just, he's upset that there are these issues it's that he's concerned that they can't be fixed. I think that he knows that they can be fixed and, and kind of just talking around after the game or uh, not yesterday. It feels like it was yesterday. Uh, I was talking to the players after the game Saturday. It just kind of got the vibe that there was a lot of stupid mistakes that they know that they can fix. And I think that especially defensively, uh, because the entire Chris Kleiman tenure, you have noticed even when the offense doesn't play well, Chris Kleiman is very quickly to point out that the defense can help them. And I think that you kind of get the vibe that those stupid and silly mistakes that the defense made Saturday it kind of bothered him because it's an older group. And I think that with that, he is probably a little bit more disappointed and kind of wanting to see how that can be corrected and fixed. Cause I think that it can be fixed pretty easily 
but I think that he is probably more disappointed and upset that they let some silly mistakes happen when the defense is probably supposed to be the group that is carrying KC right now, if you look at the experience. Yeah, I mean, that was the expectation going into it, and and we talked about the, the safety group on this team. Seemed like they were poised to be obviously the best on this roster position-wise, but maybe even the, the best that K-State has had in a long time, and for the most part, they've kind of fallen flat on their faces where there was really nothing noticeable they did in week one, and then week two, they were probably the biggest killer defensively to this team that K-State had on Saturday against Tulane. So it's interesting to kind of see where that goes. But defense obviously can improve. What what did Chris Kleiman have to say about the offense, though? Because I think a lot of people are still on edge about Connor Riley being the offensive coordinator, and certainly there are times where the offense gets rolling. The The talent and the playmakers on, on the roster kind of shine through there. Uh, I think we saw that more so in the second half on Saturday, including Avery Johnson. DJ Gins and Dylan Edwards have been as advertised all season long. They, Those are maybe the only two guys on the team right now that you say, if you do that for all 12 regular season games, we're going to be A-OK. Everybody else, I think, has shown moments where they can improve. But what did Chris Kleiman have to say after a day in between the win against Tulane and then meeting with the media again? Yeah, offensively, again, he, he was pretty blunt and said, we have to do better. And it, it starts with sustaining drives. He said K-8 is getting uh, forced into a three and out too much. So they, they need to do better on first down and on the first play of drives. And that it kind of goes hand in hand with the Dylan Edwards situation of why he hasn't been on the field a whole lot. You look at it, K-8's offense hasn't been on the field a ton. Uh Chris Kleiman said that K-State's only averaging 55 plays right now, where last year they were kind of between that 65 and 70. And he said that you take away probably 13, 14 plays against UT Martin because the starters were not on the field the whole time. The K-State's offense really hasn't been able to get going because they haven't been able to be on the field for longer and that they're really challenging their guys to start drives better and to just start better because the second half in both games have been better. And it says, and he said, and I've kind of pointed out during games and uh, last week after the UT Martin game, it's not like Connor Riley is calling a necessarily a bad game all the time. Sometimes K State just hasn't executed well. There, there were a couple plays uh, against Tulane where if K State execute, executes blocks better on the perimeter, they probably pop. Uh, I don't necessarily love a third and eight zone read that K-State ran on their deep in their own territory uh, Saturday, but you go back and watch it. If Jaden Jackson blocks someone, that's a first down instead of a three and out. And there were a couple of plays later on where uh, K-State would run on third, third and long to try and set up a fourth and short and, and K-State couldn't block anybody. And because of that, you end up having to kick a field goal. So I, I think that execution wise, they can be better. And I think Chris Kleiman knows that and was very quick to say that. And, and it kind of goes hand in hand with Dylan Edwards, because if you're not on the field, you aren't going to be able to use him as well as you probably can. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, how much of the, the offense struggling and not getting opportunities do you actually buy as a, as a reasonable, comment as to why Dylan Edwards hasn't gotten as many opportunities as necessary. Look, I, the, the offense did not run a ton of plays on Saturday. I think 58 ended up being the number in the game against Tulane um, that they ended up running, and Dylan Edwards got 12 snaps, um, and uh, two of them ended up being really good runs that he, he was involved in, and he, he's looked impactful when he's been out there. I think that there probably needs to be some more opportunities, regardless of if you think the offense is getting, you know, only X amount of plays versus what you're expecting them to get. Um, because I, I do think we've seen, you know, play calling be stale. The the success of other players has been stale at other points too. Uh, so to me, it would make sense that you you want to try and get that guy involved more, and I think you want to make a better point of it. And it sounds like Chris Kleiman is is going in that direction. But I think yeah. you have to be sure that it actually does happen and not just keep saying, well, we know he's really good. He's doing all these great things for us. Like, actually put it into practice now. 
Yeah, I was going to say that that's the other thing that uh, Chris Common talked about too, was that it's not just the offense not being on the field a lot. It's that they know that they need to do better and get their playmakers the ball more on offense in general. And that's not just a Dylan Edwards thing. I think that's kind of a Jace Brown and a Keegan Johnson and Garrett Oakley hasn't gotten the ball a ton. So you need to get all of those guys more involved. And Chris Common said that he's just, he's challenged the offensive staff to get the ball to their playmakers more. And that's one thing that I'll point out is that when he says that he is challenging uh, staff or players, it, that, that is Chris Kleiman language for saying that he is telling them. Like he never will straight up say to the media that he is telling these guys that he need, that they need to do this or to, or for like players to be better. But like, that is him basically saying that he is telling them that they need to get the ball to their playmakers more. Well, we'll see how it all looks because you certainly have to do it against Arizona this Friday. Uh, one of the things that might make it a little bit tougher is Chris Kleiman mentioned today that they got banged up on the offensive line a little bit. So what did Chris Kleiman have to say with injury updates? Because for the most part, there hasn't been anything overly notable through the first two weeks, some linebacker stuff, but all of those guys were there and available on Saturday. And, and Austin Moore played a really good game out of that spot. Uh, but what did he have to share specifically with the offensive line? Yeah, to be honest with you, I was surprised that Chris Kleiman even brought up the the health uh, concerns of the offensive linemen because it wasn't really a question about like injury updates. But he went ahead and kind of addressed the injury issues because Hadley Panzer got banged up during the game and did not come back in. Uh, Carver Willis did get banged up and came back in. Uh, but neither of those guys practiced yesterday because uh, a short week, K-State ended up practicing on Sunday. Uh, and neither one of them practiced. And Chris Kyman kind of said it's a little too early in the week to know if they're going to be available. And, and I think that that's a big deal because it probably shortens your offensive lineman rotation to now. You probably have five guys play the whole game if neither one of those two can go. If one goes, you probably have – you can you feel comfortable with six. But that, that's where you kind of need those guys in that 8th, ninth, 10th group to really step up and be able to play more and play better. Uh, so I, I think that that's a little bit concerning. Uh, but you kind of look at it, and uh, for my money, Andrew Langang has been one of the best K-State offensive linemen that has played the entire season. So I think that he needs to probably play more anyway. So if they can get him in, and even with an injury to Hadley Panzer, it probably hurts more of the depth wise than I think it does talent wise, because I think that line gang has been really, really good in his limited time on the field. Well, it was interesting too, because for Carver Willis to come up, because he was one of only three guys that played every snap on offense uh, on Saturday. It was him, Sam Hecht, and Avery Johnson. They were the only three out there. So then to hear that he was a little bit banged up, it would maybe make sense why. Uh, there were maybe a little bit of struggles uh, from some guys on the offensive line and then just jostling those guys around. And, and so much of offensive line, what we've talked about, is just getting consistency there, and those guys have to work together as a unit, and that's tough to do uh, when, number one, you're already kind of feeling your way around trying to determine, hey, who's going to be locked in where or whatever, and that's that's a part of this early part of the season. But then you throw in the injury situation, and you're starting to have to – jog guys all over the place again. Um, what you, you talked about Andrew Line Gang. You you liked what you've seen out of him so far this year, and he's one of those guys that'll kind of get swung all over the place. What did you think of the offensive line on Saturday and versus I guess week one even? Uh, and then what would your expectations be depending on what they have to do injury wise for this game with Arizona? Yeah, I think that the the word that uh, Kleiman used today, and I think that I would probably use it as just inconsistent. They were dominant at times against Tulane, uh, but uh, there were also times where they really struggled to block anybody. They're, they've been okay in pass protection. Part of that is Avery Johnson and how he is so elusive. They didn't allow a sack uh, Saturday where, and then got five sacks on defense, which was a big part of the game that kind of went unnoticed. Uh, but they need to find more consistency. And I think that some of that is kind of the shuffling in and out with injury. Also first road game 
I know that it, it's kind of a, a lame excuse, but it is the first road game of the season, so you're kind of getting everybody used to playing in that environment. Uh, but I, I expect them to be better, and that's kind of the the theme of the week so far has been everybody kind of saying that they think that they're they're going to get better and that they know that they need to get better even though they're 2-0 and right now. So I, I think that it is good when you can win games and then still be kind of like, self-aware enough to know that you how you are playing right now isn't going to win you games in the future and, and we've kind of talked about this since the game ended against Tulane that a good team wins that game against Tulane when they don't have their best and Tulane is kind of throwing the kitchen sink at you and playing probably one of their better games all season long uh so a good team wins that game and a good team also knows that okay we did that and now we have to get better and fix all of our mistakes that we made in the previous game. Uh, I mean, again, this is just how blunt and honest that Chris Kleiman was today. He said that the defense was probably about as bad as you could be and still win a game. Well, he's he's definitely right about that. I mean, they were, they were pretty terrible uh, on Saturday. They just had really the benefit of making – being well, making two massive plays that impacted the outcome of the game, uh, the, the strip sack that turns into a fumble and a touchdown, and then uh, you end up getting the, the interception in the end zone from VJ Payne. Other than that, I mean, it was not a, a very good showing, and it was so bad in places that, like, we know how impactful the linebackers can be. Austin Romaine had an awesome game, obviously. I thought uh, Austin Moore. Had a, had a solid game as well. But for the most part, the linebackers felt like they were taken out of the game because it felt like everything either played out right around the line of scrimmage or 25 yards upfield. And, and so they weren't given as many opportunities. And then there were times where, like, uh, you know, there there is an element to this where it's coaching for K-State and, and the coaches have to do better, and Chris Kleiman has admitted that. But at some point, like, some of the mistakes that the players made on Saturday – weren't things that coaches should have to be coaching guys that have played football since they were in the third grade, you know, like Jordan Riley's complete whiff in the end zone on the last touchdown that Mensa threw in the game. Absolutely not something that should happen. Like it, it just total error on his part where uh, it's, it's been talked about, but Mensa's reaction to that play was, Holy crap. I just threw a terrible pass and I got lucky there. And Riley should have done something. I, I don't know if he whiffed on the body shot, but he really should have gone up because the coverage was was actually there and okay. Like they had that set up where they wanted. That was just a guy that didn't execute and do what he was supposed to do. I, I don't know what Joe Klanderman is supposed to do other than tell a guy do exactly what you have done since you know you were eight years old playing this game. So I, I think there was a lot of that on Saturday, and I think that this defense. You know, I don't know. Do you think they got a big head in the offseason? They were built up so much. We heard about they were having these dominant practices and everything else, and, and now we've come and seen them in two games. Obviously, the front just overwhelmed UT Martin. UT Martin did not have anybody that was the caliber that could hang with K-State. But we did see in certain moments big plays that were allowed, including, you know, the big throw that led to uh, UT Martin's really their only offensive drive that set up a score because the other came on the Jace Brown fumble. Um, and then obviously they were they were terrible on Saturday. So do you think like th there's a mentality problem that they're having right now and they have to kind of reset and get past that or is it something else? I, I think that it's just being able to like get focused. Uh, I think that some of the mistakes and it kind of just sounded like it after the game and even a little bit today uh, talking to the players that there was just kind of a, a lack of focus at times that led to some breakdowns. Uh, there were a couple instances where uh, players didn't know if they were a man or zone. One, they would have, and this is the advantage that you get when you have an experienced defense, but you have to be able to run this well, is that there were also a few times where one side of the field was in man and one side of the field was in zone, and that was as a design, but they would get a little bit mixed up. So I think that, Focus and execution is probably something that they just need to work on more. And, and I mean, from what it sounded like Saturday, talking to Chris Kleiman after the game, that they didn't execute very well at practice last week. And, and I think they kind of saw that on the field Saturday. 
Yeah, the uh, the con- that was that was one of the more notable comments I think from after the game on Saturday from Chris Kleinman uh, was talking about that it wasn't just it wasn't the fact that you know they didn't have energy or certain other things it was just that they didn't execute more like there probably was some lapses on their part and he said it's really tough to execute in a game when you don't execute in a practice and really he kind of just said like that's the worst kind of bad practice you can have not low energy or whatever else but or like just bad performances just not actually coming through on that end so fascinating to see where things go uh for k-state in week three because now they get arizona which i the oddity of saturday in the big 12 was that at 1 30 you thought k-state and oklahoma state might actually suck and they were not going to be contenders in the big 12 and then even when the game ended and, and both had won you go okay K State's probably going to let Arizona State score, or excuse me, Arizona score forty nine points. Maybe Arizona State too down the road, based on the way Scadaboo ran. Uh, you're going to get torched by McMillan. Fafita's going to dice you up, and then Arizona goes out there and only scores twenty two points on Northern Arizona, and was down ten six at halftime in that game. Uh, what did Chris Kleiman have to say about the matchup with Arizona? Yeah, he was really complimentary about Arizona, and I mean, I, I don't want to say like as he should, but Arizona's a pretty damn good football team that is coming into Manhattan Friday. And it was really complimentary about Noah Fafita, was really complimentary about McMillan, so that they probably have the, the best connection among wide receivers and quarterbacks, or wide receiver and quarterback that he has ever seen at K-State. And, and I think that goes back to Fafita and McMillan have played together forever, uh, I think since like eighth grade at, the, at this point. Uh, so I think that that kind of plays a part in it. Uh, but he seems, I mean, Chris Kleiman will always hype up the other team, uh, but it, it was taken to another level when talking about Fafita and McMillan. And I, and I think for good reason. I mean, uh, McMillan is going to be in contention for the Bluntikoff award at the end of the season. Like he, he is that good. Yeah. It's going to be interesting to see how they kind of work things out. Uh, I'll ask you this. We'll have a, a longer show tomorrow. You, me, and Fan will get together since uh, because of the weird travel schedule. No Sunday show, but we'll get that crew together this week to break down Tulane and get ready for Arizona. Uh, but do you have any expectations for Avery Johnson and his performance? Because it does feel like week one to week two, there was a step up in the right direction. Still not where you want to be from him, but maybe he's going to get there. Do you have expectations and any thoughts from what he had to say today uh, when he met with the media? Yeah, I think that we'll continue to see him grow. I think that he was more impressed with how he played uh, against Tulane than he was against UT Martin, but still knows that there's a lot of areas to improve on. I mean, one of the things that he said that he he knows that he needs to improve on is uh, just more consistency uh, on the deep ball because he said that he knows that he missed Sterling Lockett wide open near the end of the half. That would have made it a, a three-point game right before the half. So I think that with that, you kind of get a little bit of what is to come. I think that my expectation for him is that he will probably have a pretty good game against what I still think is a little bit of a shaky Arizona defense. And I think that you'll get the benefit of playing at home and everybody should be pretty amped up and probably a little bit more relaxed and you kind of know what to do offensively. Uh, the one thing that I, I will add as a little bit of a, my own commentary here is with how K-State offense, K-State's offense has looked, I think that if they win the coin toss, I, I think I would want the ball. I want to start things right offensively and kind of get that script going and kind of prove not just to yourself but to everybody that okay hey we have figured this out and we can execute at a high level uh this isn't meant to be as big of a shot as it's going to sound i would agree with that sentiment if colin klein was still the offensive coordinator a guy that this is not his first rodeo but this is quite literally connor riley's real first rodeo this season only game three I personally don't have the faith or trust in Connor Riley right now to put that kind of expectation and pressure on him and his unit. Like, 
and Chris Kleiman has said it, the coaches have to be better too. And that's not just coach speak from him here. It's, it's everybody has to be better. And I think he knows that it's his guys that have to be better. Look, Chris Kleiman has no problem standing up and calling out guys that are close to him when he needs to. He fired his, one of his best friends from being his offensive coordinator because the guy just didn't have it when, when they needed it. Connor Riley has to be a lot better right now. And, He's he he. That's not to say he hasn't done a lot of great things because I think that gets overlooked and and how this stuff has been portrayed. Connor Riley is calling good plays. He is at times putting them in the right positions, but I think he is still trying to figure out the flow of a game and how to sequence the play calling. Like you know, there's there's how do you sequence your pitches when you're when you're you're pitching in a major league baseball game? Like certain guys are going to go up there and you have the matchup where boom, it's just heater after heater going to just fire it as hard as you can and, and you'll be fine. But there's also the element of, okay, well, I've, I've thrown, you know, two straight fastballs to this guy and they've been in this part of the plate. He's looked like he hasn't been able to hit him. I need to go back to that spot or other times where, Oh, that guy just, just barely missed taking a yard on, on this pitch. I'm not going to go in that same spot again or with that same pitch. Like don't do that. And that's where, on Saturday against Tulane, that last drive K-State had before they were fortunate to force the pick from V.J. Payne, after that first play did not work out with D.J. Giddens, the second play, the second down play needed to be better and different. And I think they've come out a little too passive in these games. I almost wonder if it would be better for the K-State offense, and this is philosophically speaking. Not, I know that analytically speaking – and every everything else, this is not better for anybody. But it might be better for them to get the kick in their pants of, okay, we're down seven nothing already. We got to go out in attack mode. I think they've been just a little too passive early on and been content with, eh, let's just kind of see if this kind of hits and if it happens or whatever. Um, I think they just need to be more aggressive on Saturday and, and aggressive in a, a smart way because you could say they were aggressive to start the game against UT Martin, but. That was not a smart aggressive. That was just a, hey, we, we need to work on throwing the ball. Let, let's try and get this thing down the field and move it. That's not what you need. You need to find the right balance. You need to use your personnel accurately. Um, and so Connor Riley has to do that before I buy in and think that in a game against a team as good as Arizona, you should just say, we win the toss, boom, offense, get out there. Let's get this party started in here. Black Eyed Peas style. See, that's why I'm the opposite of you. I want them to be aggressive from the jump by taking the ball. I mean, we'll see. I, I I would absolutely love it, but there would be this little thing in the back of my head where I go, I don't know that I trust the guy calling the plays right now to make it happen. I mean, that's that was a thought that ran through my head on the, the fourth down play, uh, fourth and one, fourth and two, whatever it ended up being. They went for the touchdown to DJ Giddens. In that moment, at that point, based on what I'd seen during the game, I had confidence for the most part that the players could make the play, but they needed to be put in the right spot to execute. And I just didn't believe in that moment that they were going to get it. Uh, and fortunately enough, they did. They they got what they needed out of it, but and Connor Riley deserves credit for it. But you also wonder too, you had your two most talented guys on the field hook up to make that play. Um, and that's where you go. Did, did those guys just make a play? Or was it a combination of all things? What was the percentage there? And, and that's also where you talked about the offensive line um, and and how they had some some big highs and some way down lows against Tulane on Saturday. I think that's another one where it's probably tougher to, to feel out the game when your offensive line is being inconsistent like that. Um, but Connor Riley, he is the offensive line coach. He probably needs to be a little bit more in tune with that and be able to realize, okay, uh, this type of run or this stretch here has not been kind to our O line. I need to do some things where there's not as much on their plate because there was some of the the play calling in that game where I, maybe it wasn't a terrible decision to make if you're Connor Riley to call a certain play, but it may not have been the right time to put a lot on the offensive line's plate. Like we saw a couple of like just the design runs immediately for Avery Johnson that. The offensive line gave you zero shot to do anything on those plays. And, I mean, the one play was going to be like a six, seven-yard loss, and I think they were fortunate that they returned it into like a two- or three-yard loss um, that they eventually – I think that was – that may have been the drive that they scored the fourth-and-one touchdown on. 
the one of those plays that I'm thinking of. So I think there's just a lot that this team has to be a lot more understanding and and just kind of with the program on uh, with how they play against Arizona. So it's going to be fascinating to see how it plays out. But if if they're going to come out and be aggressive and they think that they've identified some of their weak spots uh, and they're ready to have Dylan Edwards on the field early enough uh, and and get the right balance with him and DJ Giddens then sure, take the ball, go out and make it happen. But you're not setting yourself up for success if you go out there and you give the ball back after running like four plays again uh, to start the the game offensively. So we'll see how it ends up looking. Yeah, I think that's fair. That also, it does put pressure on you to, you have to at least get a field goal on the drive. But I think that I would like it. I just want more aggression, kind of like you. And, And you start off like, hey, we're here, like we scored. I think that that would kind of go a long way. Well, I agree. I mean, it would be great if they go out there and they get seven points immediately on Arizona. um, This defense can still be really good. Like the defense started the game strong against Tulane. There were a couple big plays, but they were able to bow up because I do think the defensive line play is improved from last year. The linebackers are really good. I mean, we've seen through two games now, two guys make, just massive plays uh, in each game. First, it was Des Purnell. Then it was Austin Romaine. And that doesn't even mention Austin Moore, who is by far your steadiest linebacker. So that's where, like, I think the defense has it in them. It's probably going to be up to the secondary on if they can clean up their mistakes and um, kind of educate those guys. And the other thing, too, going back to this real quick, is you talked about there were guys that didn't, like they got confused or were they in zone were they in man that's another one of those that to me illustrates that's not really something that's on the coaches at this point like these guys they know the plays they know the calls you should be able to be accountable for yourself to know what you're supposed to be doing on a certain play um and yet like everybody else has to help out like it's good to get reminders but it's really not on the the coach at that point if you forget you know like if you're if you're in school and the three weeks you've been in this swing where you've been learning about one thing and the teacher has taught you everything you need to know and you go out there and you still get a D on the test, well, it's not on the teacher at that point. It's on you, which I know that from firsthand experience because, look, if it, if it was, if I did not put in a lot of effort into my schooling experience. So you throw me out there and, you know, in algebra or something, Boom, I'm I'm semi paying attention throughout the, the stretch of this curriculum, but you go throw me out in the test like I haven't paid attention enough. That's not on that's not on you as the instructor. That's on me. Uh, that's a me problem. And I think that's where some of the players have to be a little bit more accountable uh in, in that end. And we'll see if they step it up uh, on, on Saturday. And that's one that's easy too. Like you just lock in a little bit more. You You make sure that you have it right because there are definitely guys on this defense that know what everybody's supposed to be doing. Like, if you need somebody to help you out, I I am sure that Austin Moore can tell you, no, no, you're supposed to be doing this here. Or, like, this is what you need to um, also just find better ways to mask it if you do mess up. Because there were a couple times where if you go and look at some of the bigger two lane plays, it just looked like some guys were frozen there, feet stuck in the mud. Um, If you are going to be lost, at least try to find your way back, even if you get even more lost. So we'll see how it ends up uh, going with Arizona on Friday, and we'll talk about that more tomorrow. Uh, Any other final thoughts from what you took away from media availability today? No, just that everybody, the the consistent message, like I said, was just to continue to get better. So I think that they aren't satisfied, and I think that everybody should kind of be I don't want to say relieved or pleased with that, but like they, they know that they need to get better. So I, I think that like that does kind of have some meaning going forward. Yep. That sounds good. All right. We will be back again tomorrow. Uh, we'll have something throughout the day, me and DUI probably. And then we'll be back tomorrow night. Most of you'll probably get it Wednesday morning with Drew fan and I previewing Arizona, kind of giving some thoughts, maybe not necessarily fully from the Tulane game, but just general thoughts through the first two weeks of the season because while the Cats are 2-0, it is apparent that there are issues there that need to be fixed, and uh, we'll see if K-State gets them corrected on the short week turnaround with Arizona. So for Drew Galloway, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching the K-State Online Show. 
We will be back again tomorrow. Go to On3 in the meantime. Get everything you need coverage-wise from the weekend and also today with Chris Kleiman's media availability. And, uh, yeah, we'll uh, we'll do everything else leading up to game week. Short week, so everything will be kind of compact. A lot of content coming in the next four days. We're out of here. Talk to you again.